Hey guys, my name is Caitlin Moose, and happy 500th anniversary of the Reformation! The hootie woody what now? <laughs> I thought it was Halloween. What's this all about? I'm a Lutheran. That is a Protestant denomination of Christianity. This was started by Martin Luther. No, not that Martin Luther. The, this Martin Luther. He was a German monk who on this day, October 31st, 500 years ago started the Reformation, which was trying to reform the Catholic Church, but it ended up splitting the church into two, Catholics and Protestants, those who were protesting the church. I was very fortunate to be able to go on a Reformation tour last year around Germany with my parents and a group from our church. And I just thought it would be interesting for me to be able to share my experience of that tour and what I learned. So yes, I hope you enjoy. Let's get started. Our story begins 500 years ago in the town of Wittenberg, Germany. All right, so here we are in the town square of Wittenberg, and they now have this great statue of Martin Luther, and next to him is Philip Melanchthon, who was another professor and theologian that helped a lot with the Reformation. So, okay, and now we are in Wittenberg with Martin Luther. Martin Luther. <laughs> and they put this cool globe for the 500th anniversary celebration, so <laughs> So as I said, Martin Luther was a monk and he had a lot of anxiety about his sinfulness and the fact that he couldn't please God no matter how much he fasted or prayed all night. So Martin Luther was really studying the Bible, trying to understand, and he came to this realization that we are saved through God's grace alone, not through any good works that you could do or buying your way out of purgatory. Christ died for our sins on the cross and we were saved by grace alone, through faith alone, on the basis of scripture alone. And another practice that Luther really didn't like was the selling of indulgences. How to explain indulgences. Basically, a piece of paper, a letter from the church saying that your punishment for your sins would be lessened and you could buy them for yourself or a relative and for example uh, to lessen your time in purgatory. Luther had all these grievances with these discrepancies he was seeing between what the church was doing and what he thought the Bible was saying and so we wrote them out for these 95 topics of discussion because remember he just wanted to reform the Catholic Church not actually split from it. So he took these, they were the 95 theses and he nailed them to the door of the castle church. Hashtag nailed it. So if we walk down this little road from town square you come to Castle Church. You can look up, see this tower, look over here, and there are these kind of funky doors. And here we see a bronze copy of the 95 Theses. The original doors were destroyed in 1760 during the Seven Years' War. We got to go inside of Castle Church. That's actually where Martin Luther is buried along next to his friend Philip Melanchthon. I actually went up in the pulpit. Well, I just walked up his pulpit. Not quite sure that was legal. It wasn't. They just yelled at us. But look at this. I guess you weren't supposed to do that, but my pastor had said they'd done it on previous trips, so I think maybe they were just renovating things for the celebration for this year, but anyways. <laughs> so everywhere with Luther and the Reformation, you're going to see the Luther Rose. So this is Luther's personal seal. Here you see a cross on top of a heart, because through Christ's crucifixion, he removed sin from our heart. The white flower representing joy and peace with God the blue representing our future home in heaven, and the golden circle to signify that our life in heaven will go on forever. So back to the 95 Theses. Other people before Luther had voiced their concerns about the church and disagreements with what they were doing. But a huge reason that Luther was successful was the recent invention of the printing press by Johannes Gutenberg. That made information available to the masses. And another important figure in Wittenberg was Lucas Cronach the Elder. He was a painter who did a lot of the portraits of Luther and his family, and also would work with this printing press. They would take woodcuts and, you know, take the ink press it down. That's the printing press. You can actually go to Cronach's house and see this kind of setup, see the printing press. Here you can see their family seal, the winged serpent. You see this cut of Martin Luther, the image that would have been printed. So that was all really fascinating. And Cronach was a huge part of taking Luther's writings and distributing them amongst the masses, along with these really intricate illustrations that would help those who are illiterate to understand. You can also visit Philip Melanchthon's house. He was this great intellectual and Martin Luther's friend and helped write the Augsburg Confession so you can see his house and how he lived in a lot of those original texts. Also at Wittenberg was Luther's house. This is where he and oh, I'm getting ahead of myself, but as Luther's message started to spread and people were agreeing with him, the Catholic Church had to take note and be like, uh-uh. Martin Luther was actually sent a papal bull, not that kind of bull, like a, like a decree 
saying, this is a cease and desist. You need to take back what you've said or you will be excommunicated. And Martin Luther was like, nah, I'm gonna burn this. And he was summoned to the Diet of Worms. And that's not a Diet of Worms. That would be gross. He was summoned to dispute the Imperial Congress at a city called Worms. Uh, so much scarier to essentially grill Luther and saying, no, what you're saying is not right. And Luther's like, you can't prove it through scripture or any kind of rational thought. So no, I'm not going to take back what I've said. And the Catholic Church said, all right, you are a heretic, you are excommunicated, and therefore you can be killed at will. And I'm gonna stop that story right there and skip ahead. I'll get back to it, don't worry. Because back in Wittenberg, there is also the Luther House. Luther House. Ah. And I wanted to say that he's now excommunicated, so he's no longer with the church, and he marries a former nun, Katharina von Bora. I wanted to go ahead and explain some of that so that wouldn't sound quite as weird, uh, but that also set the precedent for um, allowing Protestant clergy to marry. So Luther was a German monk. He married a former nun, and apparently it's good luck to kiss her ring. And at Luther House, it was once an Augustinian monastery. It became Luther's home with his wife, who was 26 while he was 42, by the way. They had six children and they always had people over for intellectual discussions. It's now the world's largest Reformation museum. Right now you can go and see an exhibit of what Luther's living room was set up like. A mighty fortress is our God. Yes, I sang A Mighty Fortress is Our God in Luther's living room. That's his most famous hymn that he wrote. There's also St. Mary's Church. That's where Luther married Katharina von Bora. That's where their children were baptized. That's where he preached a lot of his sermons. That's where services were held in German rather than Latin. That communion took place. It's kind of known as the mother church of the Reformation. So I would definitely recommend Wittenberg to visit. So let's move on from Wittenberg to Leipzig which was a city I loved because it had so much to do with Johann Sebastian Bach, but that was in the 1700s, so let's stick to Luther. But it was there in 1519 that Luther had this famous dispute with Dr. Eck, the famous Leipzig disputation, and that kind of marked his definitive break with the Catholic Church as opposed to just trying to reform it. And so in 1539, Leipzig became a Protestant city and Luther came to St. Thomas Church to preach. And a lot of people at this time had heard of Martin Luther, had read his writings that were circulating. So the place was packed, apparently so packed that people took ladders and leaned them against the outside of the building so that they could come up to the windows and join in. Of course, 200 years later, this church would become famous for a different reason as Johann Sebastian Bach was the choir master there for the last 27 years of his life. And he's actually buried up at the front near the altar. So it was really cool to see that. There's a Bach Museum there and I would love to talk to you more about classical music, but I'll save that for another video. <laughs> One other cool place in Leipzig was the Auerbach's Keller restaurant, which I'm sure I just butchered that pronunciation, but here is my amazing coaster from it. <laughs> Ching! They have been serving food since 1525. Their patrons included Luther and Bach, so it was just a really cool place to be like, wow, I'm eating at the same place these amazing people came through. So let's jump over to Eisleben. This is where Luther was born and where he died. He was born in 1483 and he died here in 1546. That was at the age of 62. So we were able to visit his birth house and his death place. They were both converted into a museum so you could see more about Luther's life. And also I wanted to look in on Google Earth to see this town square. So over here we stayed somewhere over there and this big statue of Luther wasn't there because it was being renovated. Obviously we were there the year before the big 500 year anniversary. Um, so some things were still under construction and this big statue is missing. <laughs> uh, so I wanted to say, here you go, this is what it should look like. And that is right in front of St. Andrew's Church and that's where he preached his last four sermons before he died. There's also this cute little guy <laughs> which was put up for the 500th anniversary of the Reformation. So just lots of cool things going on in celebration of this year. Also, there is a St. Peter and Paul church where Luther was baptized. And now the way it's been redone, baptism is really at the center of the church and it's really gorgeous. That is Eisleben. So now let's head over to Erfurt, which I'm sure just pronouncing that so beautifully. Erfurt. 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 Maximum Erfurt. <laughs> Erfurt. That's what I'm gonna say. 
I really actually loved this town. Um, it was just so beautiful and kind of intimate and walkable and we were actually really lucky we got to stay in the monastery where Luther was a monk. That's just amazing. We got to attend a service there, uh, the beautiful courtyard, and then walking distance to everything. So to the history lesson, Luther actually was studying to be a lawyer. He had already gotten his bachelor and master's degrees. As the story goes, he was riding home one night and caught up in a thunderstorm, and he was almost struck by a bolt of lightning, and he cries out, Saint Anne! Because his father Hans was a copper miner, and Saint Anne was the patron saint of miners. So he goes, Saint Anne, help me and I will become a monk. Just like that. And this is where he stayed in the Augustinian monastery in Erfurt. My parents and I actually hiked up uh, to this Petersburg citadel. It's this gr great fortress with incredible view overlooking the city, especially this big town square. So there in that square is the St. Mary's Cathedral. That is where Martin Luther was ordained as a priest in 1507 at the age of 23. There is also the Merchant's Church where Martin Luther preached. And also uh, Bach's parents were married there in 1668. So that's cool, <laughs> back to Bach. Okay, stop. And also there's just this really cool, uh, the medieval Kramer Bridge where there are shops and houses built along this bridge that was built in the 11th century. So Martin Luther would have been familiar with it. And again, just cool to say, hey, this was here when Luther was around. So many other things to discover in Erfurt. I wish we'd had more time. I would love to go back and explore because the town is absolutely beautiful. Mainly where he became a monk and poured over the Bible, was asking questions, just felt so much anxiety. So he was sent to teach at the university in Wittenberg. And you know from the beginning of this tale how that ended up. So Martin Luther nails the 95 Theses to the door of the castle church, burns the papal bull, goes to the Diet of Worms, and on May 26, 1521, Emperor Charles V issues the Edict of Worms, which states, for this reason, we forbid anyone from this time forward to dare, either by words or by deeds, to receive, defend, sustain, or favor the said Martin Luther. So from this point forward, Martin Luther has been excommunicated from the church and could be killed at will. He was kidnapped by some friends and they hid him in Wartburg Castle in Eisenach. He lived there in disguise as Junke Jörg, which was Knight George, and he grew a beard and stayed hidden away in his small room, provided by Frederick the Wise, who is also buried at Castle Church in Wittenberg. And during this time, Martin Luther translated the Bible from its original Greek to German. Because remember, at this time, masses were held in Latin, only the clergy knew Latin. So in just 10 weeks, Martin Luther translates the New Testament into German. So this was a huge deal because for the first time an individual could read the Bible for themselves. Luther actually helped create the modern German language because there had been all these different dialects and he combined them all into this one single easy to understand German language and literacy rates increased with the printing press and the distribution of this Bible with illustrations from Cronach and people began to question the church the same as Luther had. It was very interesting to visit Wartburg Castle. It's a medieval fortress that was built by Count Ludwig I in 1067 and has all these incredible golden mosaics. But we were also able to see the room where Luther was hidden away and where he worked and translated the Bible. So just really incredible. Also, there's this huge Playmobil <laughs> of Luther, so there's that too. He finally comes out of hiding from Wartburg. He returns to Wittenberg, and like I said, he marries Katie and continues to preach all around Germany where the message of the Reformation is spreading. With so many different interpretations of the Bible, you had other Reformation leaders in other countries, Zwingli, Calvin, and it didn't stop at just religion. It was political and social revolution, which of course, any kind of disagreement brings heavy opposition. A lot of things turn violent. There was the Peasants' Revolt later, the Thirty Years' War. So a lot of bloodshed to really, as people stood up for what they believed in, which we still see even today. We also went to other cities. We went to Berlin and Munich, Oberammergau, where they do the Passion Play, and Nuremberg, and learn how things tie into World War II. We also visited the Bonhoeffer House, another great Lutheran leader. So definitely a lot more to this story, a lot more to our trip, but I think 
that kind of covers it for the Luther history. If you're interested in this subject, there is another famous Lutheran you could check out, Rick Steves. He created a great hour special that I'll link here. He does a great job of giving it a historical context. I hope you enjoyed that look at my Reformation tour from last year. I know a lot of congregations this year will be celebrating the 500th anniversary. Our church a couple of weeks ago just did a whole big history lesson on the Reformation, all these different characters in Luther's life. It was really interesting, really well done. Praise twice. Thanks so much for watching. I hope you found it interesting, and I will see you guys next time. Bye! What's. Wait, what's German? Auf Wiedersehen! Martin Wuta.